And today we're going to be hearing from Kevin Reeve. Kevin is the Director for Teaching and Learning Technology with AIS, um, and he's also an adjunct instructor in the ITLS department here at USU. Uh, he's been teaching online and hybrid courses since uh, 2001 here at USU. He worked with faculty to help design and build some of the very first online courses here. His greatest satisfaction comes from helping faculty uh, implement technology successfully, and also from helping students learn marketable skills. Uh, his own online course received an exemplary award in 2002, and when not working at USU, you will find him with the Cash Makers Club. It's a STEM program for kids and teens, which he co-founded co in 2013. So, Kevin, give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, tell you about my journey of ditching the textbook. So, a little bit of background. I've been teaching, as Travis said, since 2001 this class. The very first, I taught this class fully online be ever, before I ever taught it face-to-face, -face, which is really cool is because when I went to face-to-face, -to -face, I had all these resources, videos, um, uh, um, other types of resources, everything was ready to go in my face-to-face -face class. And it was an interesting thing because students soon discovered that if they didn't show up to class, they could still do my class, right? And that happens today throughout the semester uh, because I have both fully online students and my campus students and I mix them in the same Canvas course shell and have since I started teaching both face-to-face -face and this course online. I did it before it was even legal to do at this university, right? Uh, department head said, yeah, that, that's fine, just don't tell anybody. <laughs> and it worked very, very well. And what I found is that the students helped each other out. Because uh, some of the students in the face-to-face -face class would have questions and I could answer them. And then if the online students asked those questions, I found that many of the face-to-face -face students would answer them before my online, uh, I had to, uh, got in there. And so that was really, really good. So. I teach a web development course, and as you know, there's tons and tons of resources. So this, this was a natural class uh, to look at ditching the textbook. And I wanted to do this for years, but I just couldn't find the time to pull it off, all right? So a little bit about the class, okay? It's taught fully online, um, numerous textbook changes. I've changed my textbook probably at least every two, uh, four semesters, okay? or had to update it because textbooks I would adopt would soon become outdated and they didn't, the authors or the publisher didn't update them, right? This is the current tech, this was the textbook I used the last time uh, I taught it. With, so I, I ditched the textbook fall of last year. So I taught two semesters without this textbook. This, this was an excellent textbook. You can see it's about $100 at Amazon. And if you get the digital version, it's $41.99. Uh, which is pretty cheap these days when it comes down to it, but I still consider that an expensive textbook, especially for web development when you can buy the trade books for $39, right? The, the nice thing about it, it has case studies and problems and all kinds of things in it. It tracks students from about every major and discipline on this campus, from the hard computer sciences and MIS down to communication uh, majors, public relations majors, marketing majors, natural resources, educators, you name it. I've had those students in my class, including doctoral students and grad students, okay? It's very hands-on and practical, and I tell my students that this course can be a differentiator for you, uh, no matter what your, uh, gra your degree is going to be in. If you've got web development experience, it's gonna make you stand out, and if you've got a good portfolio piece, it could really, really work. And the final project is a portfolio piece. And one of my students, Kata, is back here. Wave, Kata. You took it without the textbook, right? Was that spring? So second semester. So you can really ask her about it, okay? So she was one of my students in the one with, so she's never seen it with the textbook. So that's a basic background, okay? Here was my motivation as I put it. Desire to add some interactive hands-on exercise. The textbook got rave reviews from students. They loved it because it took them hands-on. They'd open the textbook and they'd follow along and do stuff on their computer to learn how to build web pages. Always got kudos in every uh, evaluation from my students, okay? The other one was eliminating textbook costs for students. That was a, that was a, a motivation. Taking advantage of good OER resources uh, that were online. And uh, the other one was to see if I could really pull this off and it would work, right? And I'm still tweaking. Okay, I've done it for two semesters. I found in the first 
uh, go around that there were some gaps. I had my learning objectives. I found these OERESs and we'll talk about that, okay? So one of them, my motivations was costs of textbooks, right? So we, I did this presentation in June at a, a, a national conference. And so I went around about the week before I did this and took pictures of books that were in the bookstore just randomly, right? So uh, the, I didn't pick on any ones in particular per se, but I did look for expensive ones other than that, right? So here's a, uh, this is a C programming book. It's 150 bucks new. Uh, $97 to rent it. Okay, here's a research methods for general social worker work. You know, it's about that thick. $170 for a textbook. Uh, I saw this sign. I thought, this, you know, new business models evolved because of the price of textbooks, right? Uh, we didn't used to rent textbooks. That's only a thing of the last few years. Maybe we've been doing it for a while, but it's really caught on here, okay? Differential equations, $189. I don't know, how, how much has differential equations changed since 1980? Hasn't, huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, here's one, Discovering English Grammar, $159.95 for a really small book. And I, I thought this was funny as I opened the foreword. I'm gonna come back here. The purpose of this book is to reveal to you something you already know. <laughs> okay? It, if you read it, it, it makes sense, right? But that was $159 for a book that tells me something I already know, okay? Here's an international business book, right? Management, $244.95. Uh, I mean, you got, you got a kid in college, and I had three kids of my own in college a year ago, right? And I was helping them buy textbooks, right? I'm still recovering. All right, that's what it feels like, right? <laughs> okay, but there is hope. I found this book in the bookstore too about surviving depth once you purchase your textbooks, right? Guess how much that book is? $25.95, okay, so some fun. All right, so I wanted to throw this out and open to a discussion here about challenges and opportunities as you think about ditching a textbook and uh, adopting stuff that's freely available out there. What are some challenges and opportunities that come to your mind or fears? Anybody? It takes a lot of work, yeah. What else? Yeah, good, good, good point. <laughs> you find the perfect thing and they take it off line, yeah. We need one of these tools that can go through and check all your links and make sure they're still valid. I'm sure if you put stuff online, we've all been burned, right? All of a sudden, you don't have time to go check 1,000 links of stuff, that resources you've linked in every semester, and it's usually you start getting a ping from a student, and thank God for those students who work ahead, right? <laughs> those overachievers. Leslie, you had your? Yeah. Yeah. Other, other challenges and opportunities. Right, right. They may feel lost if they don't have a textbook, okay? Yeah, and both of your points bring up, it's kind of a little side note. I did some, I started noticing a, once I went to this textbook, uh, before that I'd used trade books that were in the 39 to $40 and I'd resisted, but this had such great case studies, that book. And once I adopted it, I know, noticed students, you know, I had students who had the physical book and students who had bought the digital one. And, you know, I would go to these conferences and saying, yeah, digital is the way to go, blah, blah, blah. And I was hearing, you know, students are adopting these like crazy. I had a hypothesis that the main reason students were adopting digital textbooks was why? Cheaper. So I did a survey in my class for four semesters. And I said, okay, one of the questions, it was my own evaluation at the end of the semester. And I said, I asked them several things about the course to get feedback that I wanted on how to make the course better. But one of them, I said, answer, the, answer this what, what fits the best, right? I prefer a paper book. I prefer digital. I prefer paper, but often buy the digital one to save money. Guess what was number one? 
Yes. So I debunked that whole thing that, oh yeah, students love digital and all that kind of stuff. Now I can't, there were, there were people that just said, I like the digital, right? And the challenge with the digital was if, if you had a computer screen like a laptop, you had to have it open and then you were also trying to do stuff. So I saw a lot of students who had tablets opening up the textbook on their tablet so they could follow along. So that was an interesting analysis. I haven't done that since I, got, uh, you know, I haven't done that since I ditched the textbooks, obviously, because I don't have a textbook. But that was, a, that was something that I, I was vindicated that I was able to, to show that. Okay, other, other ideas about opportunities or challenges. Yeah, Larry about copyright, excellent point. What else? Opportunities. Why do it? What are some of the opportunities? Obviously, the textbook cost is one of them, but what's, what are some opportunities you could see from this? Right. So, yeah, keeping the, the, the material fresh. Yeah. Right. You know, when you think about textbook adoption, right, you guys have taught a lot longer than, or more classes than I have. I teach one a semester for twice a year. But when you adopt a textbook, it's a lot of work to adopting a textbook, right? Because you find that you end up scaffolding your whole class around that textbook, right? And you, you go through a dozen, well, I don't know how many textbooks. I, I've gone through five or six every time I think about redoing it. And you start looking and you're looking and pretty soon it's like looking at houses, they all start looking alike, right? And you can't remember which one had that cool bathroom or that cool walk-in closet closet right after a while and you kind of have to go through this stuff and I and so that you know that that same challenge happens with this and there's lots of good open educational resources but what you wish they had was a good outline of what all they teach because I found I had to go through and vet them all and in some of these cases I had to go page by page and okay does it teach this teach that because I found lots of good resources but I had to go through and see if it matched what I needed to teach and where the gaps were and I missed I missed some critical ones that I didn't find until the semester. Not real critical showstoppers, but ones that I missed. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. If you think of anything, let me know. All right. So my approach was this. Somebody's already figured this out, right? I figured lots of people are teaching web development. I'm just going to send out some things to some listservs, and I even did it on Facebook and Twitter. I said, hey, anybody out there teaching an HTML class that's has got, found some good open educational resource, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't hear a thing back. All right, so I created, uh, so the next idea was, okay, I either got to create my own or find something that's already exists. A Google for resources and ideas, that was overload, right? Uh, compare against objectives and outcomes. Look for issues, make up my mind, and dive in. I have a terrible time making up my mind. Okay. All right, what I learned. It took the same amount of time as adopting a new textbook, in some cases it took a lot longer because at least the textbook I could look at the chapter uh, or you know the index, right, to see what was taught. Uh, to find the resources I want to use, lots of reading, lots of comparing to objectives, lots of indecision. Nothing I found contained everything I wanted. I would need to find additional resources or create my own and I ended up doing both, okay? So it takes at least, amount of, at least the same amount of time I found as adopting a new textbook which I think it takes a lot of work. So if you get a chance to go to a department where they've already got that figured out, I think that's a blessing in some ways, right? You just have to do it, okay? All right, what was missing? The textbook I used had these wonderful case studies and they build upon each other. And you know, that takes an incredible amount of work, right? You gotta start with the finished product, right? And in this case, a full website, and then you gotta Go back and cut it up into pieces that the learning things, right? That is a lot of work. That was one of the reasons I adopted the textbook is because that was really well, okay? The open content I chose, Code Academy, has great hands-on exercises, but it lacked those case studies. And I still don't have those back in there. And I miss those. And the projects that continue to build. It also did not cover some important topics. I had to find other resources. And I ended up creating some of my own. And during the first semester, I found some gaps and so I built those in for the second semester with finding additional resources or building videos and building my own and coming up with a good midterm and, and final project, okay? That was the time consuming part on my mind. Okay, where to find OER, okay? Uh, Google for it was one of the things I did. 
This number two, I think, is really, really important. You should take advantage of this hunt, huh, Aaron. Aaron, one of our librarians, is here, and she, you presented earlier today on this same topic. I didn't do this, and I should have. It took on the librarian to slug me in the arm to tell me, hey, how come you didn't? I didn't even think of it. So I didn't even think of it, but consult your subject librarians. The, our librarians here in the, in the library are fantastic, and they, they've got their thumb on this for your discipline. They're, they're paying attention. So go to them, seek them out, tell them what you're looking for, and they'll help you, right? They'll find, help you search. OER Commons is an interesting uh, place that I found that has a lot of information. YouTube, for sure, right? But I've had videos disappear from YouTube. Uh, I actually create all my own videos, and I've been putting them in the Kaltura system so they go into Canvas. Uh, so I've got a few on YouTube, and it's been fun to log back in and see, hey, my video on how to do this in HTML has got a thousand and something hits. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> OpenStax is another one that I, I found that had some good content and various others uh, depending on discipline. How many of you have searched or used some form of web-based resources for your classes? Okay, uh, go ahead and let's shout out some of the resources you found that, there's a lot. I only listed a few that I, I was, had played with and, and had gone to. Um, for looking at, at resources. And there's some that are, that are very discipline specific. So what have you found some good OER research sites? Okay, good. What else? Lots of good resources. UEN has a lot of good collation of, of resources as well. What else for discipline specific stuff? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, so open educational resource. So it could, it could be anything from a snippet, right? Uh, we used to call them learning, we call them learning objects, right, a picture. Right, it could be that, to a full-blown online textbook. There are full-blown free online textbooks. And some of those, those sites like OpenStack, OER Commons and those, they actually have full-blown online textbooks that have been, are, have been developed by faculty, teams of faculty, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been uh, supporting some of those. Aaron, what did you share in your session? What are some of the other places? And my name is Erin Davis. I'm a librarian over at Merrill Kazir Library. And we have a team of librarians right now who are working on an OER pilot project. So we have about 16 different resources that are really good. They're high quality. Um, they're basically already vetted. So like OER Commons, Merlot, we showed a couple of those. Um, University, sorry, MIT OpenCourseWare is really great because that one you can actually um, you can look at other reviews, but you can, you can download entire course shells. So you can see a syllabus, you can see readings, you can see even um, different reviews from the professor. So what they said about like the level of engagement with the class. Um, University of Minnesota Library has an excellent one called the Open Textbook Project. And they have, they actually come around to, to different schools. And a big piece of what they do is they, um, they actually have other faculty members from all over the nation review the books. So you can see Okay, so how did somebody from the physics department, you know, think about how did they, what did they think about this particular book? So if you're interested, you can um, contact me, erin.davis at usu.edu. We also have a libguide out there, um, a library research guide that has a ton of these different resources on there. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, we're crazy not to use our librarians here. They're doing it. They're doing the hard work for us. Aaron kind of uh, hinted on this at some of the other schools, co our colleagues, right, out at other institutions maybe. And let me tell you what's kind of cool that's coming with Canvas. I think it's called Commons. 
They've got so many names that start with a C, I can never keep them. They got catalog and commons. I think it's commons. But commons is a way that when we build a learning resource in our class, it could be a video, uh, a module, we can actually right click on it and save to commons. And you can actually tag it that I want it available to only these kinds of people in my department, in my school, or public. Okay? And so what's gonna, what we're going to start to see, hopefully, is people building good resources and, and stuff and sharing them. And I've kinda, I told them, you know, it's one thing about building these resources, but what if somebody finds a, a good OER resource on a subject at another site? Uh, could, we, could they not tag that and put it in their own commons so that they can use it in other classes, right? To be able to grab that resource. I mean, it's really that you're grabbing the link to it, but you could save it so that you can use it in other, other of your own courses or share it with your colleagues. So we're gonna see some kind of cool things evolve, I think, with this Cam Canvas Commons. Uh, but you can check that out. I believe it's, it's turned on now. They've, they've turned it on. And I've got a video up there when I was first playing with it when it was beta. I shared one of mine and I found out that it was totally public. I didn't even know it was. When I searched for it, here's a video that I created on doing something. And it was there and I'd forgotten I'd even done it. I was just uploading to play with it. So that's going to that's gonna kind of be a, a, a cool uh, thing to share among ourselves within our own institution and other Canvas schools, which are continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. All right. That is my presentation. How was I too quick? Were we right on time? Now you got time to take a nap. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. <laughs>